Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 20 of IGEL Weekly. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. It's just me and Chris today. Chris Feeney, how's it going? It's going well. I, I'm sitting here listening to like 20. We've done 20 of these things. I, I'm smiling and I'm, I'm, so, I'm unbelievable. Like I can't believe it just kind of keeps going, but it's been a lot of fun. Looking forward to uh, yet another topic of interest for our guests uh, listening in. So I'm actually shocked that it's only 20 um, with all the other ones I do, which is great. Um, but I'm surprised we haven't already done 20. I'm, I'm, you know, don't be surprised. You look up, we've done a hundred, you know, here a year or so from now. Uh, but that's the idea, right? Consistency. You and I were just talking before this is we just need to be consistent about getting content out there and, and valuable content and making sure people know that every, every week in general, there's going to be something new coming from us. And you know, that's, that's, um, you, you ever watch a, a sitcom or some type of hour long um, TV show that when it, when there's not a new one each week, you start getting frustrated or you get mad. Yeah. I, uh, I could say the same for a few shows right now that if I miss it, I'm going to Amazon to watch it. Uh, and then I'm sitting there waiting for like, wait, is that the end of the season? What's going on? So, so what, what are you watching right now? So I've kind of latched on to uh, CBS has some great shows, SEAL Team, uh, Magnum. Uh, we were taking a trip, uh, a long overdue, couldn't take it last year for obvious reasons, uh, trip to, for celebrate my daughter's graduation and everything. And so we're, we're heading out to the island. And uh, so we've been watching a lot of Magnum PI, uh, Hawaii Five O, just to kind of get a sense of that and everything. So excited about that. But but you kind of get into that whole storyline, right? And uh, then you, you're waiting for that new episode. And so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's kind of what we've been doing. There's a few other shows. There's, there's a time um, when, you know, during the seasons, holiday seasons, uh, we might latch on to some movies or whatever that are on. Um, but, uh, but right now, those are our, our binge shows. So um, are you familiar with Aerial America from the Smithsonian Channel? I have not. I, uh, I love Smithsonian. I grew up in the D.C. area. I've been there many, many times. So uh, tell me about it. So anytime we're going to take a trip somewhere, we watch, they do it state by state. And sometimes they also do cities in other countries too. But uh, if you're going to Hawaii, which I think is what you mentioned a minute ago, yeah. watch the Aerial America on Hawaii um, and you will get so much good stuff quickly um, that it makes it so when you do travel there, uh, you, you, you at least have a baseline. Obviously, there's a ton more you can learn about and do, but it just gives you a baseline of the area. And we go to Puerto Rico now. We went to Puerto Rico a couple months ago. We're going over Christmas and um, and uh, watching the I'll, I'll watch the Puerto Rico one again between now and then to to keep get fresh in my mind the things that I need to be on the lookout for going and seeing and doing. Yeah. In fact, uh, this to this after uh, this evening, I'll be sitting down uh, putting together sort of a, a sightseeing itinerary uh, places we're going to try to hit. Yeah. Uh, while we're there so but uh but yeah so there's plenty as far as i joe and, and and there's there's always plenty to talk about um so uh lots going on and sometimes you know things happen in the world that uh you know are, are extremely relevant to what uh we offer and today's one of those topics well yeah so you and i were talking ahead of time you had a you had a topic picked out which is a really good one around in user experience and a survey that was done and we are going to do that but we're going to push that out two weeks uh, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, iGel and securing the edge. Um, I think I've, I've done several podcasts this week and the concept of the end-to-end -end model and security on both ends of the equation and in the middle uh, has come up several times. And you're only as secure as your weakest link. And in most cases these days, and, and really has been forever, uh, that endpoint and the software running on that endpoint has been the weakest link. So we decided to cover this, uh, this blog written by Ben Ward on June 9th of this year, 2021. Uh, secure your edge. So, Chris, you want to kind of help us understand what the what the um, what the intro covers here, and it starts with the word "sadly." Uh, so we'll go from that. So, what what are we covering here in the intro of the blog? Yeah, so it's it's um relevant topic. Obviously, you know, uh, it's interesting, right? If you, take, if you take the most recent ransomware attack, uh, the one on the Colonial Pipeline, and that wasn't the most recent one. There's actually been more. Um, but it came to light that it was uh, uh, compromised user credentials, right? So in this day and age of, you know, multi-factor auth, I mean, ways to kind of prevent that, 
uh, sadly, those common things that have been, uh, you know, used before many, many times over, not just that, but just, you know, clicks, links, things that you can audit, but compromised credentials um, in this particular case led to that particular ransomware attack, uh, certainly a proliferation of it. Um, and so you would think it would be more widely, you know, demanded at this point, you know, I mean, I honestly, I prefer and appreciate, you know, the, the banking, the uh, Amazon, you know, just using that uh, before I log in, I know it's me, I know it's this machine I've used before, but I'm okay with you sending me a, a, a code that I can type in just to make sure, right? I'd rather, I'll take that security. It's not that terrible from a convenience factor, but it's uh, once again, you know, uh, it's, it's foot on the forefront. And so that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. Well, Chris, I would, I would argue that that's not what we're talking right about, right? That The idea of multi-factor and single sign-on um, all working together and, and trust but verify, that that's true. But I really think what we're talking about with this ransomware stuff is the fact that the end user has a really powerful tool in their hand that even after they've authenticated appropriately, if it's been somewhere else before, it can now have stuff resonant on it that can then do what it needs to do after the user's already authenticated appropriately. Would, would you agree that that's really where the ransomware stuff is happening at the edge these days? Yeah, certainly. Um, and uh, how it gets onto the device certainly can be a variety of factors, but once it's there and you're in. It, it's almost I mean, like the bad guys are trusting that you're gonna get this stuff and it's gonna lay there and sleep or rest. And then when you get to where you need to get to after the appropriate authentication, then it's gonna jump into action. Yeah, just start hunting and gathering, if you will. And then the sophistication of these things is obviously quite amazing. I mean, I'm not, I haven't been in that, you know, side of the security business before. Some of the vendors out there have some pretty amazing products, but the, the, the information that they can see with, with the code and what it does, it might sit dormant for a while before it, whatever. I mean, it's just, it's pretty amazing. So, so you, I, I find something else interesting you just said. You, you just talked about not necessarily being in the security business, but I know you've been at Improvada. I know you're working for iGel now, which is a read-only Linux operating system with multiple layers that can be managed um, from a central location. I, I would argue you've always been in the security business. It was just part of the products that you were selling. Right. Yeah, it was, I mean, uh, to add some more color, what I was referring to is, um, some of those deep analytics that can really kind of dive into and see what is actually going on at that that virus or or ransomware level, but but certainly uh, in my career, um, that security has always been part of that uh, from the days when I got my CISSP years ago um, and started doing security assessments and. You know, earliest part of my career, I, I worked for a defense contractor and. Uh, you know, in, this is really before IT began to, you know, proliferate in terms of, you know, LAN, WAN, uh, you know, ex expansion, internet access type thing uh, that began to emerge. And so a lot of my security focus went from the physical uh, world, uh, access control, uh, protecting classified documents that were, you know, in safes and that type of thing to, now, what about IT? How do we protect that? And now I got to learn how to secure IT if IT is going to be used for processing classified information. And I definitely had to deal with some situations where, you know, the room was closed, the little sign was up, but classified processing was occurring. But when I walked in and I saw an unclassified drive in the in the, in the computer with the classified drive, I was like, oh, crap. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had to go report that. So that wasn't fun. But uh, anyways, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, come a long way that actually kind of drove me towards uh, being in IT and security uh, from that experience. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that we were going to talk about user experience. Now we're talking about security. And the truth is, it's our job to make the best user experience while providing the appropriate level of security for the scenario or maybe even overly secured. I think those two topics really do blend together in, uh, in and actually answers what you just said 
that's why I got into IT is to give users what they need to do their job while understanding that the security element has to be there and justified and articulated uh, and blended in to that user experience uh, that we're trying to provide. Yeah. And, so, you know, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to jump us in back to the article, but go ahead. You were going to make a point. I was going to go back to the article too. <laughs> So. Well, so ransomware, right? Ransomware is so, okay. So you go back to, I don't know, 2001 timeframe. I remember working with one of my networking guys and we put a uh, Microsoft IIS server unpatched on the internet uh, to test and see how long it would take for somebody to find it and exploit it doing port scans and things. And that's, that's the old way of doing security, but then firewalls really got uh, firewalls and DMZs and multi-layer DMZs got put into place. And all of a sudden those attacks started to diminish and uh, the guys got smarter. The, they, they realized that, Hey, if you just put little traps out here, users will go out, they'll install something. They all have uh, admin rights more than likely uh, on their windows based boxes. They'll go out, they'll install this stuff, and we can just wait and let that stuff phone home. And that that's led to the rise of no longer looking for, you know, trying to inconvenience us and cause problems for us. They figured out a way to use, you know, the security vulnerabilities to make money. You want to talk through what's happened here with the, the rise of ransomware and, and, and the enablement that things like Bitcoin have enable it so that you know there's no tr money trail anymore that that to me and it hit me a couple of days ago that's the real enabler of this is the ability to actually make money through this untraceable system um you know had it not been for that happening over the last five years a lot of this wouldn't wouldn't be happening yeah well certainly you think about uh these these different trends in the market that have begun to sort of converge to the point where we are now, where you know they they can leverage these these systems like a Bitcoin, um, but you know what's uh, what's 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 really going on here, right? I mean, we know that you know access to information, whatever it is, is, is obviously very valuable, but you know it used to be let's just bring the company down or whatever, and but now somebody's like you know the, the, we can make some money off of this, and so um, you know how does that happen right i mean it, it's still i think you're still dealing with end users people can get tricked whatever and it might be they open that link or that whatever i mean there's all kinds of ways things that happen but the long and short of it is let's lock your system make it such you can't read it without special uh key to uncover it and um and uh and then you know we'll give that to you after you send some money usually millions involved uh and then uh, you'll be able to do that but is it really truly clean after that you know uh that's that's the other piece of this right are, are you 100 sure that once you get that key to recover it that it's actually really safe now or you are you know, know yeah you don't know you can't know and it's to their benefit to just keep milking you over and and so it's not if it's when and it's not just when it's how many times or how mm -hmm. how, how long will go on it's it's insane. And the idea that the, uh, you know, the cryptocurrency has enabled them to get paid doing this is just a huge, huge enabler of what a, what a huge enabler and a great example of what a world economy is going to look like. There's a lot more bad guys to work with now that are doing what they need to do to survive, make a living, and exploit us. Yeah. And it seems like they're very much targeting, uh, it could be just, you know, low-hanging fruit targets that are, oh, that one's just wide open. Let's go ahead and get it. But but it, it's it's very much now focused on let's take down these key infrastructure things or, you know, and we know hospitals have been targeted quite a bit. Certainly something like with that pipeline that occurred, the uh, impact of that happened up and down the East Coast it certainly makes you wonder like, wow, you know, I mean, what about the electric grid? Uh, I, I think I mentioned, uh, I didn't earlier on, a, on a, one of our podcasts just the other two weeks ago. I'm sitting here working, finished up my first meeting in the morning, and all of a sudden I hear this boom and uh, then a uh, uh, crash and uh, the power goes out. And I'm like, what the happened? And there was no storm or anything. And, and it was a, from what I can tell, a Pepsi truck had just done a delivery and turned down the road and the, the trailer had hit a power line and caused this thing to come down. and. You know, I'm working from Panera the rest of the day. <laughs> so things like that just make you realize like, oh, what would it take to just completely take us out to the point where how, how could we be productive? So 
Um, my, I've never experienced in terms of personal, the ransomware, but I did have one of those scenarios where, you know, went to one of those, uh, kickoff meetings, corporate IT said, we're going to put some, uh, we're going to put on a question real quick. Yeah. You, you know, for a fact, you've never had ransomware on a machine. I have personally not dealt with ransomware myself, not that other customers of mine or whatever haven't, but I myself personally, no. But but you so what you're really saying is you've never been exploited, but you don't know for a fact that True. you've never <laughs> code waiting to do it. It just never executed. And and the thing that people don't realize is there's millions and millions and millions of machines out there exploited today that haven't been told to wake up and go do something yet. Yeah, as best I can tell, that's correct. Uh, my my one experience where I would say it's somewhat like it was uh, I said we I took my laptop, the corporate IT. Uh, turned on some new security stuff, whatever encryption. Um, and uh, and then one day my laptop had an update rebooted and my, I think it was the BitLocker key, whatever it was, uh, wasn't working. And I couldn't get back into my system. And I had uh, stuff on there that I had not yet put into the cloud, if you will, in some cases. Ended up losing years of archived emails that I would often search for and, and just lost them all, you know, probably five, six, seven years worth of stuff. So anyways, um, well, but, uh, but yeah, let's, let's, okay. So ransomware is on the rise. People know that that's how they're going to make money out of taking the, uh, exploits that are available to, to them out on the, the global with the global economy and the global network, also known as the internet. That's that's how money's going to be made, and and you don't the the idea that um, you know there used to be geographical proximity uh, and and lack of proximity was a safeguard that is no longer the case, right? Somebody in somebody in any part of the world on the global network, aka the internet, can touch me whenever they need to in a matter of uh, milliseconds. That's totally changed the, the the game, and now the ransomware has become like it used to be. Um, you know, you had to go kidnap someone and take them to the ATM machine to get their money. Uh, now you just take control of their computer and then eventually their system that they're on. Uh, and now you have access to more nodes and more opportunity to encrypt stuff and more money, like real, real money. Let's, let's jump into the section that talks about decreasing the, uh, the presence at the edge and what we're really talking about here, uh, in the blog. Yeah. Kind of going back to that, that last statement there. Um, you know, being so interconnected, uh, you know, attacking a you know vulnerable, even though their security has you know certainly tightened up on Windows OSs, um, there's still plenty of attack surface there, and you know, so these actors are going after uh, that 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 vulnerability, or uh, or in many cases that that end user susceptibility, you know, to uh, do something, click on something, whatever it might be to get that in point OS. Chris, before you go there, tell mm -hmm. me what the edge is. What, what is the edge? The edge would be, um, you know, that's the first thing the user is going to uh, access to get to their data. Uh, so for us, IGEL defines that as the edge operating system. Um, that could be Windows, could be Apple, could be Android. In our case, IGEL Linux OS. Can, can I, in terms of network though, the edge is anything that's not necessarily in the core of the internet, you know, the primary routing and switching going on. So is, is your phone on the edge of the internet? Uh, technically, I would say yes. Is your, is your PC or Mac on the edge? Yes. Is, and I'm making an assumption here, but is your smart refrigerator on the edge? Um, Potentially, yes. <laughs> yeah. Anything that's not at the core of the internet is on the edge. My point in that is there's a heck of a lot of stuff on the edge. And, and I would even consider Zintegra's data center not the edge, but one of the edges because it's not at the core of the internet. There's so much edge to protect here. We've got to get really smart going forward. Yeah. Just last night, our TV, we turned it on. It was like, just got an update. I'll install it after you reboot or turn it off or whatever. You know, so it, it's smartly going out there and pulling the latest uh, LG update for that. Um, That's a great example, right? It's on the edge, 
and it's behind a firewall of some type at your house, but it's going out and proactively phoned home. What if it phoned home and got something bad? Now I've got millions of Samsung TVs waiting to attack something. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? It is. I mean, it's uh, it's it, it is. I mean, it's, it's, I don't even word the words to think about it. I mean, it's just the fact that you know, it's not just corporate people that have to deal with this, but home personal stuff, right? I mean, when will we see the you know proliferation of the end user at home dealing with ransomware on his home network, right? Not corporate stuff. Just I can't, you know, whatever. So can you imagine me calling up my 75 year old mother-in-law and asking her if her uh, Samsung TV is up to date? Is she prepared for some type of outbreak? And, and what's the latest antivirus definition on her TV? Yeah, I, it's, I think about I was thinking about where you're talking about that. I was thinking about my uh, my mother-in-law and, uh, you know, I got her uh, a new laptop at Costco. I think it was uh, sometime late last year and uh, went just for ease of use, went with a Google Chromebook and she had uh, some email or something like that, I guess a few months ago where um, somebody was saying your machine's been compromised, whatever. And she was on the phone with somebody yeah. and she called me and she says, is this legit? And I said, no, no, reboot your machine. You're going to be fine. It's a Chromebook. It's, it's, you know, and so she hung up the phone. I said, don't give them any information. Yeah. And uh, she rebooted and everything was fine. But I mean, she was literally that close to, you know, but thankfully she uh, reached out and confirmed. Do you have, uh, do you have anybody else in your per personal life that runs a windows based computer that's connected to the internet? Yeah, both my kids plus my wife, um, they all have Windows 10 laptops. Do they? Have, let me ask the, the 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 big question: Do they all have administrator rights on those machines? I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's assume you said yes. So you've got all these devices that were built to get work done, and and in most cases, like in my house, everybody gets their admin rights removed. At least they used to, anyway. Uh, now I'm just trusting that, yeah, I'm going to give you the right to install stuff. And uh, I'm going to trust that the Windows uh, operating system and the antivirus that I have will catch anything bad you try to install. Uh, that's insane to think that we give people that much power to do things where they can load anything from any website. We had a session yesterday, podcast on MSIs and MSIXs and all the different ways you get applications installed on Windows. It's extremely powerful, but along with that power comes a lot of opportunity to be exploited. Yeah, no doubt. I think um, at least for the last year and a half, my daughter was in high school. I actually had her running off of uh, a Linux OS instead and just accessing Office and, and whatever websites that she did. So she, that's how she worked. Um, and when she got to college, they, you know, got her got a new laptop and everything like that. But uh, but definitely made sure that before she went off to school, that thing at least had all the updates and had security, you know, and then and was at least somewhat locked down as much as possible. But you never know. My high school kids all run Macs and I get a call maybe three or four times a year when they're trying to do something at school with uh, the local IT guy at the school and they need the admin password because I locked them all down. Uh, it's inconvenient. And there have been a couple of times where it caused challenging situations, but I just can't give them the green light to install whatever they want. Now they're going off to college this year. They'll, they'll have their own yeah. computers and they'll have their own rights. And um, I'm going to wish them luck. You know, it, it's, uh, I thought of it just when you were talking, um, I, uh, I have toyed with the idea of giving them that backup option, which is a UD pocket just in case. And, uh, and probably will here as my daughter heads back to school in August and my son, you know, you say, if something happens, Here's your backup. Plug it in, and it's already set up. Just log in to whatever you can get your work done. Uh, so, uh, you know, coincidentally, the article kind of moves us in that direction. What, what, what do you think? I mean, what a natural transition. So we've talked about the edge, and I, real one thing, one thing to highlight real quick is uh, what enabled what you just said is the fact that you know your operating system now includes a a variant of Chrome called Chromium, or really the the engine of Chrome. Uh, and I bet, I bet in a lot of cases with the, with the online world of SaaS applications and maybe VDI in your case, um, 
that becomes a huge enabler. You know, I guess I'll go back to the, the uh, edge piece real quick and just talk about the fact that, you know, the SaaS applications, the, the code for that, as well as VDI implementations, those are also on the edge, but they're closer to the core of what we're talking about here. And they're the responsibility of other organizations to have up-to-date and working, uh, not the end user's responsibility, but it all counts as edge. Uh, and there's a lot of trust and really the term zero trust kicks in at some point, uh, zero trust. Uh, but yeah, there is trust involved in making sure those things are, are up to date and properly running and secured, but that's not your responsibility as an end user. That's, that, that's on corporate IT or whoever the retailer is, that's providing that, that as a service something. Yeah. In fact, uh, just, um, last Friday, I uh, was meeting with one of our, uh, my, one of my colleagues uh, counterpart over in EMEA and was looking at what he had set up in Azure and he had leveraged Microsoft's automate autom like he's got a, a window of time where he does all his updates he, he fires these VMs up on a Saturday morning lets Microsoft run through its update code whatever and then automatically shuts them down after whatever time and he's got this whole process and and uh you know, and, and really kind of it's it's on Microsoft, you know, at that point, would you enable that to keep these things updated and um, it's lowered his time and effort to kind of do this manually. And uh, and we were kind of talking through that and, and the time savings and stuff like that. But he's leveraged that particular capability, which I thought was really nice. So. Well, hey, before we go into IGEL, let's let's address the thing you mentioned a while ago around the Chrome operating system. That anything other than when, and, and I'm not knocking Microsoft, they've got an amazing stack of the operating system for the endpoint, aka Windows 10, uh, and it has been enabled for decades now to do powerful things. But with that power comes all the things that we're talking about here around the ability to exploit that power. Um, there's options. There's Mac. There's Linux. Um, both less attackable and well maybe less attacked um because the you know the attack vector is smaller there's less you can do with it there's things like the chrome operating system which is even less less of an attack vector but still attackable uh and then there's igel and igel is you know like the article says here purpose built for the edge to be managed with a good user experience um and secure and that's secure by I'll call it luck for the moment. And, and the luck means there's just not that many people trying to exploit a read only version of Linux. that's really only used in the enterprise because they're, you know, chances are it's uh, not gonna be out there just surfing the random internet that often. Um, and, and, and also, you know, secure because it's got the read only layers, it's got the manageability and the ability to update those layers. Um, but, you know, this part of the blog really talks about iGel in my mind, is the only uh, enterprise worthy built for all these use cases, um, secure operating system that has the management piece and the user experience to try to, you know, corral this challenge that we have of an ever evolving attack vector uh, that exploits our end users and their and their ignorance. And I, I don't mean ignorance as in derogatory. I mean, ignorance is in the fact that you almost need to be a full-time IT guy to understand what you can and can't do. And even then you get exploited because look, we're not, we're not perfect. And, and, and we go places and do things that like there's every once in a while I install some utility for something I'm doing. I'm like, ah, I wonder what's inside this thing, but okay. Install anyway. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I'm just looking through this. I mean, really, I mean, our, our mantra is, is really, I mean, you don't need a lot of information down at the endpoint level, nothing locally accessible as far as data goes. Uh, and, 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 you know, while we have capability of adding applications, you know, that might be able to store something locally or whatever like that, that's, we're not really in the business of trying to be just like a Windows OS at the edge. You know, we, we are, you know, pointing you, we're that, that uh, we've talked about it before. Um, let's imagine, you know, what you're going to get to is in the amusement park. We're the, uh, we're the shuttle to get you there to the front gate. And then from there, you can kind of go wherever you go. Maybe it's the old uh, legacy stuff that you're still accessing or the new shiny new thing that just came out with the cloud, whatever. But, but I gel is that, that shuttle to get you there. And that's really it. We're, we're very much focused on, you know, having that low attack vector uh, right out of the gate. And, um, 
uh, and not just that, but you know, we haven't really touched on it, but just the whole boot process when you are booting up into an OS, we've got this whole chain of trust. Uh, it's a great diagram. If you haven't seen it before, it's certainly on our website. Uh, it's not part of this article, but we can certainly point you in that direction. But you know, um, on, on some of our IGEL devices, the UD3, UD7, for example, with the AMD chipset, you know, doing a, a security check there before it gets to uh, the boot layers and ultimately the checking the partitions and making sure that all along the way, ultimately, when, when you uh, get to that VDI DAS session or whatever it is, you know, there's a security check. And if something gets messed up along the way, then it knows like I, we, we've been, something's wrong, right? And um, the other thing too is we haven't really talked too much about it, but when you're updating iGel, we come out with updates firmware, we have a, um, a really fail safe update process. You know, your, your current version remains there while the new version is getting installed. And then uh, on the reboot is when it executes and, and takes over. But if something happens in that, and some of those out there listening may have situa had situations where it reboots and then on the reboot, it, it's it's still updating partitions or whatever. You know, IGEL smart enough to know that it, it will go back to whatever version was still intact before it, it executes on the new one. So there's a whole very smart process there for updating uh, the devices and making sure that that isn't compromised uh, as part of uh, running the IGEL OS. So. <clears throat> well, you mentioned that uh, chain of trust document. I'm going to put it on the list for some to cover, you know, a few weeks out because that's um, for, for some of our users, that's going to be really exciting. And for some of it, it won't be. Uh, however, it's something we probably need to cover so that people have a way to consume that content. Yeah, well, I can say this. I, I'm on a internal security questionnaire. I get, I, I'm not responding to these, but I see when somebody has uh, customers that are asking these typical security FAQs, kind of part of the whole, like, you know, we have a common set of frequently asked questions around security. So uh, there's stuff that we can completely share. And then there's other stuff that would be under NDA, but we can certainly talk about the, um, the, the non-NDA stuff. Your public facing documents. So I'm sure we can cover all Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. There's plenty to talk about. So, so Chris, let's kind of wrap it up like this. How many viruses are you aware of? Aware of is a key phrase that have been um, used against the IGEL operating system. Just, just give me your answer as succinctly as you can. Uh, since I've been here in the last three years, zero. In your entire knowledge of IGEL, how many times has a virus outbreak happened? Zero. Zero. Now, as succinctly as possible, and this is what I want to leave our listeners with, give me one, two, three, four reasons why. Um, well, starting, I guess, with the number one, um, from the, you know, uh, number one, like I said, read-only OS, uh, the less ports, there's only, you know, can when I you fire this thing one? up. Can I put yeah, one in front of that one? I'm oh, sorry, say it. Can I put one in front of that one? Yeah. It's the same reason your daughter ran Linux in high school. It's Linux. It just, nobody cares to attack it that much. Not that it's vul not vulnerable. It is. But if you attacked it, what would you get out of it? Okay, you've got five users. Okay, go exploit that and make a billion dollars. Well, you can't. It's Linux. That's, let's use that for number yeah, one. Yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah, in no particular order. Uh, if you look at, you know, the endpoint operating system market, Linux is certainly much less than a Windows or whatever. So just the sheer numbers, right? We're... We're not going to get attacked as much uh, because of that reason. Um, but as those numbers are growing, uh, we've already got, you know, certainly in place the ability to thwart a lot of that uh, activity uh, because of how it's been built. Um, you know, uh, being read only, not a lot of ports that are open at all on the device. Uh, the security of being able to get managed, uh, not being able to get taken over by a rogue uh, UMS server, for example. A um, uh, few others that come to mind. I mean, just uh, we've removed the ability to install stuff. Uh, you know, you can't go out and download some Linux application package um, you know, because we've we've taken those pieces away, right? I mean, there's a variety of things. So, um, hey, Chris, uh, but, just yeah. a quick question. No, and you 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 can, but you need to put it into a custom partition, so you're not going to do it trivially, right? Yeah, what I'm referring to is uh, let's just you know take IGEL out of the box, uh, and, and you fire up a command line, right? You know, uh, apt update get. You know, we've 
all that stuff that you would normally go through at the command level, gone. That that doesn't exist. We've removed that capability. Uh, the only way you could add third party type apps would be that custom partition piece. So, okay. So we got uh, we got Linux. We've got the fact I think you may or may not have said this, but it's managed and read only. Um, we've got the fact that you end user can't just randomly install applications. What else? Mentioned just the, the ports, right? Um, you know, when uh, the device boots up, what ports are open? What 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 capabilities exist to be able to you know scan the device and see what's there? Um, you know, so that uh, low attack vector there. Um, other pieces too, um, because we're modularized, uh, if you don't need certain things that might be vulnerable for some odd reason, you don't have to install them. You know, maybe it's uh, the Firefox browser needs to be updated, which we update very frequently, same with Chromium. Um, but, but you can remove some of those pieces uh, to even reduce the attack factor even more um, so that that modular OS uh, capability, um, you know, those partitions that are part of the IGEL OS itself. Um, okay. Uh, you, yeah. Anything else? That's a ton. That's a ton. That's, yeah, that's just to start off the top of my head. We've got a whole, like, list of things that, um, that will, if we want to, we can dive into that on a, on a future one, sort of those, the top 10 security things or whatever. I know we've got uh, some stuff out there that we kind of referred to earlier, that's but... I think the simplest way to say it is, and I am a Microsoft fan, but you cannot secure Windows. There's just too much there to secure. And when you close one door, one hole, another hole opens. Right. <clears throat> Certainly, I think, to productive usage, right? I mean, um, Windows is built for applications to be installed in a lot of cases directly on the OS. Uh, to be productive, a lot of those apps these days need to talk to the cloud, you know, so um, we're arguing that it doesn't necessarily have to be on the endpoint, you know, in today's world. So, so here's my, my best example. Like I had this conversation with a security person and I'll tell them, okay, look out the window, look at the car out there and I'll grab their laptop and pretend to walk out of the room. And the response there is, well, it's encrypted, which a lot of times it's not, but the fact that there is resonant stuff on the endpoint and I can pick that endpoint, take it away and then spend five years trying to crack into it. Let's just avoid that altogether and let's make nothing on the endpoint, but let's still make it a consumable solution and just nothing ever leaves the data center. My favorite example of that is Wikilinks, you know, had Edward Snowden only been using a promoting protocol from a secure endpoint. He, with, and we turned off file transfer across the protocol, he would have had to take in a screen print of every page of those 10,000 documents that he stole. I can't think of a better example of just, that's not even ransomware. That's just an end user being um, malicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. I was thinking too, I mean, just other scenarios where not having windows on the endpoint just, you know, rapidly gives you a capability to deal with something, right? Um, one of the use cases, <clears throat> dealing with um, uh, disasters, natural disasters, uh, uh, you know, local law enforcement, public safety officials, you know, being able to, if they're leveraging a, a, the, cl the cloud, SaaS, whatever, being able to take laptops that might be in storage until they need them, pull them out and just boot up to iGel or the UD Pocket. Uh, if it needs an update, whatever, then, you know, within literally just a short amount of time, assuming internet coverage, satellite, whatever, uh, you can be in a productive state dealing with uh, really what you've been trained to do, and that's deal with those disaster situations, right? Whether it's a tornado or hurricane or, or whatever, fire, something. Um, but uh, but having a, uh, a robust made for the cloud workspace edge OS uh, certainly uh, will help you. Um, anyway, so great, great uh, article. Uh, check it out on our blog site. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely uh, talk some more on uh, more security stuff in future episodes. Yeah, great. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you joining. And uh, I think we could talk about this topic almost every week. We'll, we'll find other things to talk about. I think we may have talked about security a lot lately. But, yeah. You know, getting users to do their job efficiently and being secure and protecting them from themselves. It's kind of like 
uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, getting into a nightclub or something. You don't want people to stand in line, but at the same time, you don't want so many people in that you create a fire hazard and cause an issue where something really bad could happen. Yeah, no doubt. So you make them stand in line outside on the edge. <laughs> that may have been a stretch, but I thought I'd try it anyway. Yeah, unless you're Andy, you get a VIP pass. <laughs> uh, not most of the time, but occasionally. Occasionally. All right, Chris, thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your week. And I appreciate you joining us. We'll, uh, we'll do it again, I think, next week with Seb, Community Podcast. Sounds great. Thanks, man. Thank you.